Hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, INTAC, and the NTAC Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Nicholas Boyce, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director, ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Nicholas Boyce, or Nick Boyce as he wants to be addressed, is an accredited conservator restorer with over 20 years experience in the conservation of historically important buildings, monuments and sculptures in the United Kingdom. Some of the important conservation projects conducted by him include the conservation of the Temple of Decision in Kingdom of Fife, Fife in 2016. This temple project needed expert guidance to ensure remedial works that were sympathetic to the original designer's intent. Uh, we will hopefully be listening more about this project in the future. He was also involved as a director in the conservation of Roslyn Chapel, Edinburgh from 2009 to 13. This will be discussed today in detail. Other interesting project that he was involved with was the conservation of Glasgow School of Art building designed by the world-renowned Charles Rene McIntosh in 2014. This building was damaged by fire. The other significant conservation projects conducted by him include conservation of the Earl Robert statue in Glasgow, conservation of the Kelvin Way Bridge statuary, statuary in Glasgow, the relocation and conservation of the Earl Hague statue in Edinburgh Castle, and the multi-phase conservation works to High Kirk of St. Giles from 2004 to 12. Now the title for today's talk is Conservation of a Treasure in Stone. Roslyn Chapel is a sandstone building of international significance founded in 1446 by Simon Sinclair in Edinburgh, Scotland, in UK. The construction work ceased in 1484 AD when Sir William Sinclair died. The result is an unfinished, highly decorated masonry structure described as a treasure in stone. The chapel has been the subject of painting, poetry, and pilgrimage throughout its history. A project of conservation treatment was undertaken over a four-year program from 2009, which gave the conservation team comprising of 20 people led by Nick Boyles an opportunity to apply museum-type conservation treatments to, identify, to identified items of stone defect, damage, and decay. Now, this project will be shared and discussed today. Now, before I request Mr. Nick Boyce to start the presentation, may I please request all of you to switch your microphones to mute. Uh, the questions will be taken up right at the end of the talk. So please do type in those in the chat box. I'll keep an eye for them. And also type in your name, uh, organization name, and email ID in the chat box. So welcome, Nick. I now request you to start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Padma. And I would like to extend my thanks to INTAC for giving me the opportunity today to speak to you about um, unfinished 15th century chapel. As you can see in this first slide, we have a view of the chapel and this is before the conservation project um, started and I hope to take you through this journey. So, as described within uh, the introduction, it is not my description of Rosalind Chapel that it is a treasure in stone. This is a description that became evident hundreds of years ago when people visited the chapel. And what they were able to see were biblical stories and uh, hypocritical tales um, carved in the beautiful sandstone of Rosalind Chapel. Obviously built at a time when literacy was limited within the population, Rosalind Chapel served to be a visual description of the Bible. Um, and not just the Bible, interestingly. So um, we will speak a little bit later about other carved detail that um, doesn't allude to Christianity particularly, but sort of make up the very interesting layering of codes um, as embedded within the building. So within this presentation, I shall be giving you a brief history of Rosalind Chapel. Um, in addition, I will Rosalind Chapel serves as a wonderful vehicle by which to chart um, the development of conservation work. Um, there were remedial works um, applied to Rosalind Chapel 
before the word conservation, I think, was particularly used. Then we will get into the nitty gritty and we will sort of look a little bit at the sort of forensic individual items of defect, damage and decay, which were affecting um, the building fabric at um, the commencement of our project in 2009. Then it will be my privilege to really then canter through the conservation treatments that we conducted, how we responded in particular to those individual items of defect, damage and decay. And uh, I will serve to illustrate um, the benefits of those treatments and the efficacy of those treatments. And now with the benefit of hindsight, now 10 years on, just what value those museum type treatments have had on the original building fabric. So if I may just um, provide you with a location of Rosalind Chapel. So many of you are right in the center of this map, um, but I would like you to cast your eyes north and then west and you will see United Kingdom. And we are located in the north of the United Kingdom and in the center of the map there, you can see the word Edinburgh. And Rosalind Chapel is located eight miles southwest of central Edinburgh. And here is a, a view which really then you might begin to chime with the idea of a treasure in stone or a Bible in stone. So what this um, slightly difficult photograph, difficult photograph to take given the nature, the size and the scale of the building. But what you can see there are five panels in the extended barrel vault, um, each with their individual floral motif. Um, and you can see niches on both sides of the clerestory, the high level windows, um, which were intended to, to host um, statuary. Talk a little bit about the unfinished nature of this building going forwards. I have to say that this nowadays is a very rare photograph to be able to take because it is an incredibly busy tourist attraction and um, it is seldom that you have an opportunity to be in this building on one's own. So if we were able to fly above Roslyn Chapel, um, we would see this building in plan as it is. Um, and what you can see on the right hand side is the sacristy or the crypt, which is a subterranean um, space. It's actually below the ground. Um, then you see the choir of Roslyn Chapel. And then you can see the, what, a, what a, we colloquially call the stumps of the transepts. So at the top of the picture, we can see the north transept. And at the bottom of the picture, we can see the beginning of the south, south transept. Now, this is illustrating beautifully the unfinished nature of Rosalind Chapel. What we have is the choir and the beginnings of the transepts built before the main charisma, uh, charismatic character who built this chapel. When he died, the work died, the work stopped. So what we were left with here is the choir now acting as the nave. So the nave being the main body of the church. And it's a credit to the versatility of Rosalind Chapel that it, it continues to serve this function of a working church even uh, to this day. Um, on the left hand side, we can see an external building, an external uh, baptistry. And this was a 19th century addition to the, uh, the 15th century building in order to give the church um, a greater degree of functionality. By that I mean that within the baptistry there is a font for baptizing young children and the, there are some bells located in the, the top level of the baptistry. And here we have a wonderful bird's view of that unfinished nature. You can see on the left hand side there the, the baptistry, the decorated stone structure that extends out of the unfinished west end of that building. Um, and also what you see from this particular slide is the high sort of gothic decoration. We see um, the, the flying buttresses and we see um, 
towers. We see the extended barrel vault roof there. Um, at this point, pre-conservation -cons project covered in a mesh felt material. So the brief chronology goes as follows. 1446, work begins at Roslyn Chapel. And there was a fashion uh, within Scotland at this time for building French type chapels. And Sir William Sinclair um, was married to a woman called Elizabeth Douglas, who was part of a much larger affluent family within Scotland, who themselves have built a beautiful French chapel um, by the name of Seton Chapel, uh, about 10 miles away from Rosalind Chapel. Both of them were envisaged as collegiate chapels, not just teaching um, priests and ministers and monks, but also teaching stonemasons and um, craftsmen. So this has been a learning vehicle from the very, very first design um, idea. So Elizabeth Douglas said to uh, William Sinclair one morning, I would like a French chapel. And so Sir William Sinclair set about creating uh, the most amazing building on the footprint on top of a hill within his land. 1446 work commenced, 1484, sadly Sir William Sinclair dies. And this being a charisma driven project, when he dies, the project simply ceases, it stops. And in one respect, when one is allowed to visit Roslyn Chapel without any tourists or visitors, there very much is a Mary, a Mary Celeste type sense of the, the craftsmen, the stonemasons have simply gone away for their lunch and, and have not come back. And in fact, they have not come back for 550 years. In 1571, a storm of iconoclasm came over Scotland. So the Reformation began and Rosalind Chapel was built as a Catholic chapel with all of its decoration and all of its liturgy carefully built into the fabric in terms of piscinas, the, 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 the water holding pockets within the masonry for the washing of hands as part of the service. Oliver Cromwell, the main protagonist within the Reformation, was uh, taken with the building to, to the point where he instructed his men to use swords to clip off the heads of angel figures carved into the um, decoration. Um, any iconoclastic, any human forms were destroyed. They were simply had their head, heads lopped off. Um, and we can actually see this very process, you can, see the pro you can see the effect of that. There are some very clean breaks of um, some of the angel figures, and we'll see some of those later on in this presentation. Even though Rosalind Chapel was a throbbing light of um, Catholicism, the worst that Oliver Cromwell did while he was sacking William Sinclair's castle a little bit further down the hill, the worst thing he did was to lop off a number of the angel figures' heads and keep his horses inside the chapel. Other than that, the chapel survived that wave of iconoclasm as it came through. So that happened. The chapel effectively fell into disrepair. Um, and then sort of latter part of the middle part of this, um, this, the 1700s, there began um, a recognition that Rosalind Chapel was a place of significant value. And so here we begin to see some of the early conservation treatments, though of course they're not called conservation at this time. So we're seeing repairs to the roof, we're seeing some practical readjustment, which we'll see illustrated in a moment. Um, and we're seeing some of the flagstones internally, perhaps damaged by um, Oliver Cromwell's horses repaired and replaced inside the church. And then in the 19th century, in the 1840s actually, and then in, again in the 1860s, there were two known phases of restoration works by two very eminent architects working at that time. 
So um, William Byrne was the architect responsible, for example, of um, modernizing um, St. Giles Cathedral right in the center of Edinburgh by giving it a very beautiful, formally dressed ashlar overcoat over a random rustic um, 14th century masonry structure. So William Byrne did his work in the 1840s and in the 1860s, uh, uh, David Bryce, another well-known architect, um, undertook um, some remedial works, which we'll again, we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and with the benefit now of hindsight, we can judge quite well which were the, or, uh, which were the acceptable, the sympathetic, the authentic um, remedial treatments and which served to take authenticity and were certainly not sympathetic, but remove authenticity from the building. And we'll discuss that um, a little bit going forwards. So in the latter part of the 19th century, in the 1880s, say, Rosalind Chapel became a building that could accommodate the congregation, the, the worshipping public were allowed back into the building. And then it started to function once again as an ecclesiastical building and has done so without any um, pause from that point to this. And then in the 1950s, in the middle part of the 20th century, we know that the Ministry of Works undertook a whole range of remedial works. And we have the benefit of much better records and we actually have the benefit of um, moving um, uh, video of those, obviously not video, but film at that time, of those works being actually undertaken. And we can again take our views from the 21st century, just what the practices were in the middle of the 20th century and whether they are acceptable to us now, given our own sort of conservation understandings. So Padma's introduction recorded that Rosalind Chapel has been a magnet to people who have wished to draw, paint, write about, and generally um, pilgrimage towards uh, Rosalind Chapel. And so what that means is from the very earliest time, and in this case, 1761, we have an amazing record of Rosalind Chapel through the ages, its condition and um, you know, how it may have changed over the time. And so what we have now is at the east, illustrated within this picture, is um, a pitched roof sitting over the Lady Chapel. And you can see, um, you can see just um, obscuring part of the east window there. And you can see those half roofs continue along the Clear Street level. So this is um, uh, uh, an archive from 1761 and then from in uh, as a section through the building you can see just the nature of those lean-to um, structures um, giving some comfort to anyone who's inside that chapel because at this point the clear street windows and in fact most of the windows were unglazed as part of the window the works ceasing um, promptly with Sir William Sinclair's death so as you can view along uh, Rosalind Chapel, you can see those primitive timber structures just reaching up halfway to the Clear Street windows right there. So what is drawn relates precisely to what we can see now on the building. So um, I suggest that Rosalind Chapel is an incredible resource not least because it is the most beautiful unfinished building that I know of, but also it's incredibly honest and the evidence of those previous works are incredibly legible. So what we can see um, highlighted on this left hand side of this, on the left hand side of this slide, are the raggles and the raggles I think are probably a Scottish word for cutting into the masonry in order to create a, a section for those primitive timber structures to sit in uh, securely against the masonry structure. So there you can see on the left hand side within that orange box, you can see a diagonal raggle peaking at the top and then beginning to um, uh, go back down again as part of those primitive lean-to structures to keep the wind, the weather 
and the snow out of the Clearstree windows. This um, is a photograph dating from 1840. So this is William Burns' um, period of works. And what I like to think we're seeing here is a stonemason sitting on a windowsill, just about to have his lunch perhaps. Um, but I'd like you to sort of take a mental photograph of uh, this tracery design. This is a fairly common rectilineal um, tracery window of, of an English type of um, design. But this is not the window that we see today. So what we know is that the person sitting on the windowsill here is about to take this window apart and then replace it with um, a, a particularly special design. So continuing to look at um, drawn and photographed and written um, work according to what was done during, uh, to Rosamond Chapel during its history, we're now able to source files upon files upon files of correspondence relating to the works undertaken during the 1950s by the Ministry of Works. Now it's interesting to note that the Ministry of Works are themselves a predecessor to uh, Historic Scotland, who are the um, government agency, who, who were the government agency responsible for the care of historic um, structures within Scotland. And Historic Scotland have now become in Historic Environment Scotland, whose mandate have become, has become even wider in terms of understanding uh, historic um, landscapes, environments, um, so what we're looking at here is the great grandfather of Historic Environment Scotland and this record keeping is of high quality and is, it is in detail, it is detailed in nature and very descriptive so we can understand precisely what was intended to do during the 1950s work. Now what's quite interesting and a lesson for us now is that while there are a great number of documents stating what they were going to do, there aren't any documents relating to what they actually did. This is um, part of a screenshot of part of uh, the um, Ministry of Works approach to creating a birdcage type scaffold structure high up within the Clearstory um, beams running across a Clearstory level and then reaching high up into the barrel vault of Roslyn Chapel. And we we're able to confirm the, um, that this is actually what they did because we've got some uh, movie image just to show us what they were working on. So here you can see 1950s um, practitioners. This is the scaffold that I was describing. Obviously it's crying out in terms of health and safety for handrails and not being fully boarded. And we see these guys who are happy in their work um, applying a solution, a consolidating solution to the internal stonework that we now know to be um, ammonium fluoride of silica. And this guy is smiling. He is happy in his work. If we fast forward now, this is a photograph taken in the early 1990s, so the end of the 20th century. And the structure that you are seeing here is uh, a temporary enclosure. It is a temporary metal umbrella that um, is designed very carefully, and very conscientiously to um, sit on the ground. It cannot penetrate the ground because of course, Rosalind Chapel sits within a graveyard. And in addition, um, the tolerances between this metal structure and the masonry itself are very, very finely uh, defined, close enough to give us tactile access where we need it, but far enough away so as not to cause any inadvertent damage to the, to the masonry. Um, and I'd quite like just to explain my, just try and describe one of my ex early experiences. So I first um, saw Rosalind Chapel in 1993 when I was working for Historic Scotland and I was asked to go and um, survey part of the chapel in order to um, provide 
a submission uh, to the architect's overall report on Roslyn Chapel, the condition of it at this point. So as a stone conservator, I was being asked to provide some specific information um, to this uh, document. So I was writing what's called an, an, addend an addendum report. So Nick, could you please go up to Roslyn Chapel and survey, um, uh, I forget exactly what I was being asked to look at, but I did as I was told and I went to Roslyn Chapel and I knocked on the coach house door. So there's, a, there's a, another historic building a little bit down the hill from Roslyn Chapel, which is, a, which is actually an old coaching house. So this is a, an early hotel. Um, and that in itself is a beautiful historic building uh, dating from the 17th century. Anyway, I knocked on the door and the custodian then simply gave me a, a large key and was invite, and invited me to go and let myself in. So you can imagine my surprise and delight at making my way into the precinct here, walking up to the north door, opening the north door and seeing what was inside. Then it became obvious from the Historic Scotland report and my addendum report, the building was suffering chronic, chronic water ingress. And I say chronic twice, simply because there were the 1950s um, works which put on a new roof, but here we are 40 years later, no maintenance had been done to the roof. And so there were very um, open joints and points of leakage right there. So this is a drawing, the same section looking through the building, but this is obviously of the um, temporary enclosure. And you can see just the nature of the sort of umbrella um, uh, function it's having. Not only did it stop the most of the rainwater from falling on the roof, but it also uh, stopped a lot of the high air speeds and wind um, issues um, that were causing um, defect damage and decay to the building. So I like to think that this um, temporary enclosure was something of a handbrake, that being a handbrake within a car. So to stop the car rolling down the hill, you apply the handbrake. And in terms of stopping further decay occurring to this historic building, we applied the temporary enclosure handbrake. When I opened the door in 1993, this was the view that I got. So what, you, what we are looking at now is we're looking inside the chapel, we're looking straight up 12 meters above, and we're seeing a great proliferation of biological material. This is as a result of chronic water ingress. This is also as a result of um, condensation cycles. Rosalyn Chapel is at this point unheated and uh, at least unheated for much of the week. And so you can imagine that as the temperature dropped below a certain dew point within Rosalyn Chapel, the very dense, damp air um, simply then condense on cold surfaces, not least the barrel vault itself, but also stained glass windows and with inevitable runoff to the stonework underneath. And here we have another view and we can see almost a tide mark. This is looking at a clear street window. Um, we're looking at the top of the screen at the uh, barrel vault detail as it comes down. And then you can see sort of the biological growth is heavy and then begins to sort of decline a little bit as the lower, lower down we come, uh, the wall to the wall. But also I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom of the slide and we have this sort of black dark staining. At the top we have green biological growth, at the bottom we have black dead biological growth. growth. So we can see that there is a cycle of wetting, drying, um, condensation, um, water ingress, we can see here 40 years worth of um, decay occurring on a sort of an environmental um, signal. So back in 1993, this was the technology of the day. This was, um, this is a working drawing that I made and scanned from my notebook. Um, and what you can see here are my very carefully chosen grid of um, moisture surveys using a conductivity meter, so a non-invasive moisture um, survey exercise. 
in order to try and understand patterns of damp as they were occurring in different parts of the masonry structure, which we'll go on to talk a little bit about later. <coughs> Excuse me. So we get into the nitty gritty here. We get into sort of a forensic um, defining session, as I see it, of stone decay um, and previous treatments and alterations. So these are three distinct headings, stone decay being the, the natural breakdown, the natural deterioration of this sandstone, this red, old red Devonian sandstone. Previous treatments, we're looking at previous interventions, we're looking at those raggles that we saw in the building, we're looking at the work that William Byrne and David Bryce's men did and what the effect has had on that building. And then we're also looking at alterations, which really um, is a, 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 to define this would be how changes occur over time in terms of the growth of biological material, the growth of woody material. Um, we'll continue. So in terms of stone decay, and this is right at the center of my own target, I love to talk uh, in detail about each of these items, but time will not permit me. You might heave a sigh of relief. But we'll talk about cracks. We will talk about pits, as we describe them, scaling. We will see the effects of disaggregation. We will look at and explain the process of delamination. And we will also talk about uh, loose fragments, and these will all be illustrated. So, cracks, and here we have a photograph of one of the pinnacles on the outside of Roslyn Chapel. Um, if you'll cast your minds back, we spoke a little bit about the Gothic um, language of this masonry building. So we have these exquisite pinnacles with these lovely floral motifs. Um, and this is what we're looking at right now. And if you look dead in the center of this particular photograph, we have a vertical crack. Now, this for me is a telltale. This is whispering very quietly to me that what we have inside is a metal dowel that has corroded and expanded. And this is, not only is this a stone decay issue, but this is also um, an, um, an intervention by uh, the 19th century masons. Here we have a lovely oblique view of the pitting of this particular uh, stone. Now I've described it just previously as being an old red Devonian sandstone. And this is its geological characteristic. This is what it's called, but not all of it is red. So we'll see later in this um, um, presentation that Rosalind Chapel features stone of a number of different colors, a gray stone, a yellow stone, and a red stone. And what we're, here, what we're seeing here is the grey, old red Devonian sandstone. And what I would say is that we found the quarry from which Rosalind Chapel stonework was quarried. And the river has carved a channel straight through the quarry. And what we see are these three colours all folded into each other. Um, so this is, a, this is fascinating as part of the uh, sort of geological makeup of Rosalind Chapel stone. And here we have an illustration of scaling. So scaling being the detachment of the surface area of a given stone, uh, responding to the shape that it has been cut. So we have contour scaling, and I would argue that this is contour scaling because we have this stone reacting to the shape it has been cut from the block that was originally quarried, and then a mineral transition to the surface creates a harder surface, and, but also creates a less porous surface. And what we then result, what then results is this loss of that particular surface. And this is regrettable because the surface is the surface that the mason has carved. This surface holds key decorative information, but it also holds key um, person information 
because there's so many areas of Rosalind Chapel, the mason will have left his own mason's mark in order to communicate to his boss exactly which stones he carved and he built at that time. And here we have um, a visual representation of disaggregation. This is where, and again, this is a red piece of this old red Devonian sandstone. And if I were to take my digital finger and run this across that stone surface, then sand would drop from that action. So what has happened with this area is that the binding matrix of this particular sandstone has deteriorated, which has then resulted in the aggregate becoming free and loose at the surface, hence the term disaggregation. Um, uh, again, another regrettable process leading, resulting in the loss of much important detail. And here we can see an example of where um, disaggregation has eroded uh, an important carved stone. However, you will perhaps be surprised to know that this stone, and when I say this stone, this is, this is the worn stone in the middle of this picture, below that um, niche, carved decorative niche. Um, you'll be surprised to know that we actually maintained that stone as it was um, before conservation. It remained in a similar condition, though thoroughly consolidated at the end of that conservation process. But this is a great example of just see, of showing um, of Rosalind Chapel speaking eloquently about its age. Um, this stone speaks eloquently about um, it standing in Scottish landscape for more than 500 years and experiencing wind speeds of more than 100 miles per hour um, on this prominent hilltop. And we also have delamination. Now many of you will know that stone, whether it's a limestone or indeed a sandstone, is the um, it's a sedimentary material laid down as a, as a, a soup um, back in the dark, dark times of history. Um, so often the sand um, and the binder material are laid down as two separate items, but over time and pressure, these form to become the solid stone that we are all um, acquainted with. And of course, as a result, uh, sedimentary stone has a natural sedimentary bed, a horizontal sedimentary bed. Um, and in many masonry um, occasions, stone should be used in this natural horizontal bed. Sometimes it can be used when it's face bedded, as we say, or indeed edge bedded um, to orientate it through 90 degrees in that way. However, this stone should have been face, uh, should have been sedimentarily bedded, should have been naturally bedded. But in fact, the mason was given a piece of stone that was insufficiently high, but it was sufficiently long. So what he was unwittingly asked to do was to simply carve a stone on its edge. And then with 500 years worth of um, weather, as I just described earlier, we see the undoing of those sedimentary layers. We see the um, penetration of water within the sedimentary layers. And um, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that we can actually put our hands through the sedimentary layers of this stone that had delaminate, delaminated to that point. And finally, we have loose fragments. So carved detail is extended out to the peripherals of the stone and it, the stone is being asked to um, accommodate the most finest of detail. And it's inevitable that a sedimentary layer will be, interrupt this um, particular projection. And that's exactly what we have here. We have um, a stone which is simply undone at a particularly beautiful carved detail. We have asphalt 
uh, we have the interventions now. So we're going to talk about how our predecessors intervened within the building and what the effects of those interventions were. And we're going to speak in detail about asphalt runoff. We're going to, I'm going to give you a, um, a, a narrative um, that I learnt reading the documentation, but it's also being, I'm being told this particular narrative by the building itself. Um, we're also seeing the use of ordinary Portland cement, which um, is unwelcome uh, within the conservation of this particular historic and any, having said that, any historic masonry structure. And we're also seeing something that I alluded to a little bit earlier, oxide jacking, which is the oxidiz oxidization of ferrous metal elements that have been retrofitted within the masonry structure by the 19th century interventionists who thought that it was necessary. We now know that it wasn't, and worse than wasn't, we now know that they are in fact damaging. So first of all, asphalt runoff, and what the orange arrows here are showing are the dribbles and, and splashings of a liquid asphalt uh, material. And having uh, read the documentation um, in detail, I know that the Ministry of Works subcontracted the replacement of the barrel vault roof covering. And they subcontracted it to a company called the Trinidad Asphalt and Lake Company, in brackets, Edinburgh Limited. So in Edinburgh, there was a company that um, specialised in providing asphalt material for road surfaces and maybe some flat garage sur roof surfaces. And in this case, somebody had the idea that asphalt would be an appropriate material to, to place on the barrel vault. Anyway, there was a, a great deal of written correspondence between the then Earl's factor, the man who was responsible for looking after the building for the, for the family, for the Earl, and the foreman of the Ministry of Works team because um, of this soiling. So what we know is that the Trinidad Asphalt Company were hauling buckets of hot asphalt up onto the roof and then spreading it onto the barrel roof in a correct manner. But then they were simply throwing the empty uh, buckets off the building landing um, 15 meters below. And so what we're seeing here is evidence of exactly this happening. So we've got these thin strands of asphalt um, running over the, the, the historic masonry structure. Now, this is a great time to talk about authenticity. Um, so William Sinclair did not envisage or plan this building to be sold by streaks of black asphalt. And so it is my view that these are inauthentic additions to the building and it is a simple process that we should reverse this inauthentic addition. And this is what we did. In the um, 1860s then, David Bryce period of remedial works, we could see the wide scale use of ordinary Portland cement. Now we know this is 1860 because um, ordinary Portland cement is a 19th century invention and this, a little bit like iconoclasm, iconoclasm the, the availability of ordinary Portland cement as a building material became widespread through, in Scotland, throughout Scotland um, in uh, the late 19th century. So this is 1860s work that we're seeing. And or, the use of ordinary Portland cement based mortars in my view, is doubly damaging. Damaging to put it in and then suffer the effects of preferential erosion because the ordinary Portland cement material is harder than the neighboring sandstone. And in the face of high wind speed and rain, absorption and frost perhaps, we see a preferential erosion of the sandstone as a result of the close proximity of the hard, hard ordinary Portland cement. So this is unwelcome in the first case, but then it's also 
and dangerous and um, unwelcome act to try and take it out in, in respect. So you need to be very careful. We need to have a great deal of understanding of the nature of this ordinary Portland cement and try and relieve the tension that's within it and detach it from the, the historic masonry without detriment to the masonry. So doubly damaging, damaging when, it, when they put it in, damaging when we try and take it out. But we have learned to minimize the damage taking it out by wetting it, for example, and le leaving the water to dwell within the ordinary Portland cement. And then it's the water that creates the division between the stone and the cement itself. William Byrne, famous, we've seen his work at St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. Um, we know that at that point he dressed the 14th century rough random masonry structure with a fine 19th century formal ashlar masonry overcoat. And being of his time, he used um, dog cramp technology. So metal stitches effectively, which here you can see have been used to stitch individual stones together that have been added by William Byrne to the plinth of Roslyn Chapel in order to give the building some a great a little bit further wedding uh, weather protection a little bit further presence on the ground and keeping feet off the original masonry so there is a 19th century plinth construction around the building that feature these um, metal dog cramps and of course as I've alluded to earlier metal uh, corrodes and as it corrodes it expands as part of its oxidization and of course stone simply cannot tolerate the expansive forces of uh, corroding dog cramps and so it simply splits the stone apart and that's exactly the, uh, what we're seeing illustrated within these slides and the third uh, heading, if you like, within this particular part of the presentation, um, we're looking at alterations, so changes that occur to the masonry structure over time as a result of external factors, not necessarily um, human. <clears throat> so the first being biological growth, and it's quite interesting that Rosalind Chapel, as you might imagine, was originally intended to be cruciform in structure, in plan, head Try and remember that slide at the beginning where we see the building in plan. Um, we have, uh, and it faces east, as many churches indeed do. And so as a result, we have a south side and we have a north side. And both of these elevations behave very differently as a result of um, um, sunlight, moisture content. Um, so really what I'm talking about is that there is a greater proliferation of biological material, and here we can see lichen um, affecting the north side of the building. So the north side features algae, features um, lichen, um, whereas the south side is bereft of any biological material. And here we can see um, the fruiting body of lichen being partially removed here by scalpel. Um, and lichen is known to be detrimental to uh, historic sandstone surfaces because, and if I can demonstrate with my hand, in different climatic conditions, lichens swell and then dry out, swell and then dry out. And what you can often see, and what we're seeing, beginning to see the signs of in the centre of this slide, is the hole that that lichen will drill into the stonework as a result of this constant flexing of the fruiting body. So we feel um, thoroughly entitled to remove uh, the lichen fruiting bodies. And here we see algal growth um, affecting the north side again. So everything has acquired a green tinge. And I'm suggesting to you that this is inauthentic. So, so William Sinclair's vision of Rosalind Chapel what did not include uh, one green elevation and one non-green elevation. So using, um, I'll demonstrate a little bit earlier, the techniques that we use to remove this biological material. 
we can also see the evidence of salt efflorescence. So we um, actually can attribute this process to a previous um, period of remedial works. So David Bryce, we know, we know um, undertook to apply a positive rainwater management system at Roslyn Chapel by hiding drain pipes within the stonework. But the technology failed very quickly. And what that meant was that the rainwater was being channeled into the stonework. And what we see here is the salt efflorescence, the response of that stone to the constant drenching and the mobility of um, salt crystals that have emanated from the ground, have emanated from the use of cement elsewhere. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about salt efflorescence. And we have environmental pollution soiling. So this is as a result of European industrial fallout uh, from the 19th century through into the 20th century. And the, um, it's well known that in the United Kingdom, for example, our, our location next to mainland Europe meant that we received a lot of industrial fallout. And in fact, that our rainwater fell as a mild sulfuric acid as a result of those pollution products. Um, um, and so anyone in the UK will understand this concept of acid rain. And what we're seeing here is the stone responding to not only the sort of high sulfuric nature of the rainfall, but also um, the migration of um, magnesium silicate to the surface and the sort of hydrocarbons. Edinburgh is dis described as old reeky. And this is a colloquial term talking about how Edinburgh used to be um, a very, very smoky city. That all of the chimneys were um, uh, uh, polluting the environment with black smoke, old reeky. And so what we're seeing here is a combination of the industrial European fallout and the local fallout of coal-fired um, smoke um, blowing over Rosnan Chapel, resulting in this environmental pollution product that we know is damaging. What's um, ironic about the environmental pollution soiling, and we're, we're on the south elevation at this point, and we're not suffering any biological material, as you can see, but we are suffering a disaggregating surface due to high wind speeds um, promoted by the, um, the environmental pollution products. So in, a state, in the same way that ordinary Portland cement is inappropriate because it provides a harder, more durable material to the stone than the stone itself, environmental pollution pol crust in this way does exactly the same thing, promotes preferential erosion. And that is what we're seeing right here. But what is ironic about this view is that it's, one might argue that it's the environmental pollution soiling that's giving one legibility of the carving. You can see the carving because it's black and contrast with the white stone. Um, so this is um, unfortunate, but it's the environmental pollution soiling that is fast forwarding, it's accelerating the decay of this carved detail. And here we have a detail of uh, a beautiful quatrefoil, a four leafed flower carved beautifully into, the, into this pinnacle. Um, um, and then you can see the extent of decay uh, as a result of the brutally hard environmental pollution products. <coughs> so now we're going to get to the uh, nitty gritty. We're going to talk about the conservation works. Um, I'm conscious of time and so I'll clip along this quite neatly and if you have any questions and I'd be del delighted to hear from you at the end of this presentation. So we're going to talk about the roof, we're going to talk about the bell tower, we're going to talk about clearstery, canopy removal and we're going to talk about the nature of how we scaffolded the building in order to give ourselves a working environment to apply these um, uh, museum type treatments on this architectural scale. So, Trinidad Asphalt Lake Company, Edinburgh, applied this asphalt roof covering to the barrel vault. And while the temporary enclosure, um, the temporary metal umbrella, if you can remember, was in place, 
we were able to use this um, as a method by which to protect the workforce in removing the asphalt, asphalt material from the, from the stone surface. So picture top left here is a very skilled mason using a light dummy, a light mallet and a very, very sharp chisel and very slowly and carefully just um, pinging this hard material from the stone surface. And what we found at this point was that the masonry was effectively shrugging off this alien material. This asphalt material was becoming um, shrugged off and easy to remove by this um, hand tool method. And what we found underneath were the most, was the most beautiful construction. So this is an extended barrel vault. This is an arch, a self-supporting arch that extends itself over those five bays that you could see internally. And um, I, I'm delighted to report that we've discovered that the stone that the mason is touching in the photograph on the left-hand side of this uh, screen, if you were to go inside and go up a very tall ladder and touch one of those beautiful floral motifs at the same point, you are both touching the same stone because we could determine using a laser to scan this structure that, the, that this extended uh, barrel vault was just 100 millimeters thick, just four inches thick. So you can imagine it is like an eggshell um, and it's utterly virtuosic. It's, it's, the, it's an incredible feat of masonry engineering in my view. So we were as well using the lightest mason with the sharpest chisel and the lightest dummy. And we were as well to ensure that he was attached to the um, overarching, overarching um, temporary enclosure in terms of health and safety and any falling risks over the side there. Um, and what we then went on to do as part of the overall conservation and access project was to provide very clever honeycomb uh, insulation panels um, to the same radius of this barrel vault and cover the um, insulation panels with lead. So on the right hand side of the screen you can see this beautifully crafted in the, in the same sense as originally intended Rosalind Chapel was collegiate in terms of allowing skilled craftsmen to show their apprentices just how work should be conducted. And here we can begin to see the temporary enclosure being removed. The temporary canopy had to be removed in order to allow us to put scaffold in its place to, in, to create the correct working environment for the four year project that we had still to do. And here is a view of one of those scaffold pods. Um, and these pods effectively were built individually to each bay. We divided each of the bays up, each of the elevations up into the um, six or eight bays. And these pods, a scaffolder, a team of scaffolders were permanently engaged working with us to remove one pod and then move it over to the next one while we were working on um, in one pod. So there was this sort of continual mobilization in a westerly direction as the works commenced. And this illustrates exactly the sort of bay nature of the um, scaffolding as we worked. So we commenced um, uh, phased work on the east to start with and then we started N7, S7 with two pods built S6, S7 and then we started to migrate back towards the lower numbers. How did we respond to the proliferation of biological material? Well we used two toothbrushes and natural sponges uh, in order to very carefully remove uh, the biological material and mobilize the sort of green runoff from the masonry structure using sponges. How do we respond to the growth of lichen? Well, I alluded to this earlier. We used scalpels and dental tools 
to work on a in a magnified visual sense. So the conservatory is, is wearing some magnified glasses, and um, in this case, she is just simply tearing off the um, uh, fruiting body of the lichen, having previously soaked it over a period of time in order to make sure that it's soft, pliable, and not likely to grab the masonry structure. How did we respond to salt efflorescence? Again, using similar dental tools that you can see on the left-hand side. Um, you can see the great um, uh, crystallization of salt material on the surface. This is harmless efflorescence, but also what we were experiencing were slightly less harmless, actually harmful, cryptofluorescence, which is where we have the crystallization. We have stone crystals reverting back to their crystal, crystalline form within the masonry structure, within the masonry surface itself, cryptofluorescence. So in crystallizing inside the stone, that has the effect of breaking up the sort of micro architecture of the pore structure of the stone. So we're removing what we can see on the surface. We're using uh, dental tools and um, small paintbrushes. And we're actually trying to reach into the stone using um, bleach free, acid free um, blotting paper poultices in order to create a false surface of the stone. What we do is we soak the stone on a very, very warm day, of which there are a few in Scotland. Then we know that by soaking the stone, we, have, we are mobilizing the, the salts. We are turning them back into solution and we're making them mobile within the stone. What we then do is apply this blotting paper poultice and allow the stone simply to dry out. On a warm day, the moisture is inclined to move towards this warm environment with a low water pressure. Um, and we fool the salt into crystallizing within the tissue paper. And you can see that when this happens on an architectural scale, we look a little bit like the sculptor Christo in terms of wrapping um, this beautiful masonry structure in this white material. But this was um, a scientific, this was a, a, an activity riddled with scientific rigor, right? We had to be scientific about this because we could measure the amount of salt that we were removing from the masonry structure. And we could do this with a conductivity meter that I used, the same one actually, that I used in 1993. Um, and what we were doing was simply applying, soaking, apply poultice, allow to dry out, remove the poultice, but measure the poultice for salt content in this, in this case. So the conductivity meter records salt as well as it records water. And mark this on a graph. And then repeatedly we apply the poultice. This only works in a repeated um, activity. And then we, we, point, we mark the consecutive um, poultices for their salt content. And we want to see a diminishing line. And then we simply cease this activity when, once this diminishing line um, curves um, straightens out. We know we have removed as much material as we possibly can. And here we can see that process. Um, this is beautifully sort of therapeutic. Um, and what we're able to sort of do is um, push this blotting paper poultice material into the intercies of the carved detail. And as a happy byproduct, we get this lovely reverse cast view of the carved detail. Um, and we, our response to the environmental pollution soiling that I described to you earlier um, was to use um, high tech. So you've seen the mason using low tech, you've seen hammer and mallet, and we're going to the very other end of the technical, technological curve, if you like. We're using an ND YAG conservation laser system to remove environmental pollution products. Um, so this works as a virtual toffee hammer, if you like. So the energy is being delivered by light um, and being absorbed by the environmental pollution products. And that is having the effect of um, exploding uh, the um, environmental pollution products without any detriment whatsoever to the underlying stone surface. So this is a, there is a beautiful self-limiting aspect to this work. 
And here we can see um, two uh, quatrefoil panels. And on the left there, you can see the right hand side of that flower is, has had the environmental pollution products removed without detriment to the surface. And again, on the right hand side, you can see the same um, profile half and half. And we go again from high tech down to low tech. We have a stonemason who's using his skills, in this case, to use hand tools to remove the ordinary Portland cement based material found within these beautifully fine uh, construction joints um, at the plinth course of the, just above the plinth course of Rosalind Chapel. And here you can see two um, conservators working away, repointing. Um, those, those same construction joints. So one of the beautiful things about this activity is that these guys are literally standing in the footsteps of the original masons who built Roslyn Chapel. And we're beginning to sort of, um, they're, be they're beginning to, we're able to listen to them. They're beginning to communicate with us. And in this case, they're communicating with us by, uh, we are finding the oyster shells that they have, they're slipping into the construction joints in order to minimize the mass of mortar within the construction joint. This is something that we have mimicked and aped um, right to this very day. Um, but it's delightful to see, you know, the same very good working practices being, we're being taught by uh, from 500 years ago. Um, so we, Lime being a very traditional material, of course, and we were using it wherever we could, wherever it was effective. But the nature of some cracks and fissures meant that we had to use an acrylic resin-based mortar. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see um, the application of um, Paraloid B72 acrylic resin. It's held in a solution of acetone in this case, and the acetone is simply the vehicle by which it is syringed into the um, crack. And the acetone is a highly volatile material and evaporates very quickly, but it evaporates in such a way that it leaves the paraloid B72 within the place that we intend it to be. And then on the right hand side, you can see that we're doing belt and braces. So we're consolidating the cracks with the um, um, syringe delivered paraloid B72 and then we're using B72 acetone to create a repair mortar using a carefully graded sand and you can see the conservator working away just consolidating the crack as, as we've just described and here you can see the palette of material that the uh, conservators and the masons used uh, in order to uh, make sure that the repairs that we're doing are as visually discreet as we can possibly, possibly make them. How do we respond to pits? Well, we again use Paraloid B72 acrylic resin. And the reason why we're using an acrylic resin uh, as opposed to a lime mortar based um, material is because these um, repairs are very, very small. And quite simply, we could not make lime work on this very small scale the repairs would dry out before they were able to carbonate. And here, do you remember, we were talking about the delaminated stone, the stone that was given to the mason on its end, and the way that we could put our hands through the delaminations. Well, this is an, uh, a demonstration of just exactly that. And there you can see uh, we're undoing sort of previous repair. You can see that the, the, on the right, um, the arrow is pointing to a very hard, Portland cement mortar and below it you can see a sharp tungsten chisel that's being very carefully used to chip away at that material. And on the left you can see daylight through this uh, particular stone and on the right you can see that we are, in this case we're using lime and we are using slate pinnings at this point. Um, we don't have any oyster shells, we haven't recovered any from this particular construction but we're using the sa very same techniques as our predecessors 500 years ago and um, topping off very small areas of delamination fissures that um, occur at the uh, sedimentary layers with acrylic resin-based repair mortar um, according to the colour, using the correct 
grade and colour of material to ensure, and I hope you'll agree, that these repairs are visually discreet. And I spoke a little bit earlier about the importance of conducting consolidation works to scaling. Okay, so these are simply um, uh, ashlar masonry blocks, but they are losing their surface as a result of the scaling described. And if you can see very carefully on both of, the, both of these images, on the right hand side, you can see the mason's mark. Um, it looks like a human figure, a stick figure, but this is actually a mark that's unique to the stonemason who carved this stone and, and built this stone in the place. And of course, if we were allowed to, um, if we continue to allow scaling to shred, uh, shed this surface, then this important material would be, this, this important information would be lost. Um, and you can see the conservator here working away at consolidating scaling with an acrylic resin based repair mortar to edge point the vulnerable edge, the vulnerable point of water ingress um, that, that securely is intended to securely hold that area scaling onto the surface for another generation. And our response to loose fragments is simply to use very small dabs of a polyester, fixotropic polyester resin to re-adhere these items and then point the joint using a, an acrylic resin based mortar in order to ensure that the fragment remains attached again for another generation going forwards. We conducted um, structural consolidation um, and what we saw um, once we were able to get tactile access to some of the masonry structures were we could hear that um, some of these flying buttresses, for example, were sounding um, as though they had a fault. And we were absolutely right. We found a fault. We found a very long crack running longitudinally down the vault. And our response to that then is to insert these um, stainless steel metal pins mounted flush within this stone and held securely with fixotropic polyester resin. Um, the stainless steel is as pure as we could possibly procure it. Um, and there is a British code for this particular metal and it's 316. And it is, it's the very same material that submarine propellers are made from, for example. So this um, attests to its durability and lack of corrosion risk. And here you can see good masonry practice once again, um, re rebuilding these uh, coping stones onto the reconstructed rib. Um, on a fine bed of lime mortar. And here we can see um, our response to the dog cramp damage. We're creating a very carefully created um, reverse contour um, indent repairs. And by reverse contour, I mean that we are actually carving this new stone contour to the shape of the defect rather than shaping the defect to the shape of a new piece of stone. And here is an example of just where I think the benefit of this very sensitive repair methodology um, uh, pays its dividend. And I think what I'd like to, a mantra that continues to roll around my head is less is more. The, the less that we cut away, the more remains for future generations. Now this guy, remember, he was about to deconstruct this tracery window. Uh, and he replaced it with this design of tracery window and the engrailed nature. So if you can look at the cross within the window, um, the sort of, the, the sort of, um, how might I describe that? The sort of nature of the stone being um, decorative and multidimensional there with the frills running in every direction is something of a Sinclair um, signature. And the build, the stone was built into the window in 1860s. We know that because we have the photograph to determine it. Um, and what we can see here is this stone in the very same way as the mason back in the, in the 15th century was given a stone that was incorrectly bedded. So was that guy. And so what we can see this large stone um, that sits within the window 
uh, was beginning to uh, deconstruct along sedimentary layers. And it's dangerous because um, whereas a piece of stone can benignly fall off one side and simply land on the Lady Chapel roof, a matter of one or two meters below, this is unremarkable and, un and nothing for me to lose sleep over. However, on the reverse, the other side of that um, piece of stone on the inside, uh, a stone fragment would drop 12 meters into the, into the church. Um, and uh, any stone of any size is unwelcome dropping um, that distance. So what we can see here, um, it was a very um, simple decision, decision to make uh, to replace that stone. There, were, there, were no, there was no merit in trying to repair this particular stone. So this was one of only two or three stones that we replaced um, when working at Rosalind Chapel for four years. And so you can see here that the mason is just roughing out um, this piece of stone, but already I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that we've given him a piece of stone that is correctly bedded. So you can see the sedimentary layers, you can see the veins running, um, in this case, um, vertically. But when this stone is stood up, of course, it will be, um, sediment, uh, it will be uh, naturally bedded as it's meant to be, taking the thrust of the window in an extraordinary way. And here you can see continued work and the most beautiful finished product. Now, the challenge is uh, one Sunday morning, we um, then bedded this stone. And you can imagine that this isn't just a simple process. So this stone is very heavy, it's very large, but it's incredibly fragile because the carved detail is highly intricate. Of course, we don't want to create any impact damage to this stone, bringing it through the scaffold. So um, there was a television uh, film, a television program being made uh, at this time, and it was recording some of the work that we were doing. And the, what you don't see in this, these photographs are the television production team standing behind the camera. Um, and when I see this, when I watch this film back, um, I can hear the sighs of relief from us all as we slot this stone into its position, um, absolutely as it was meant to be. And so I would quickly like to just share some of the secrets that Rosalind Chapel offered up to us. So as part of our work, we um, were inevitably being asked to carefully deconstruct pinnacles in order to um, reconstruct them properly using lime mortar beds and provide stability. So 50 years of um, aging since the previous repair episode meant that these stones were rocking on the, to, onto each other. And when we opened up this pinnacle, we were amazed to find what is in front of you now, and that is an historic beehive. And if I'm just gonna go back it suddenly became evident that this uh, whole pinnacle was the beehive, the drum. And this was not in any way bee husbandry because the, the intention and the possibility of recovering any honey is not possible. And the only access into this beehive is poetically the carved flower in that left-hand picture um, by the knee of the lower mason right there. So there's a lovely poetry about the, it's only bees that can access this space, but it is absolutely designed to accommodate bees. And once, excuse me, once we removed these old beehives and we replaced a metal, uh, a wood timber structure within the uh, beehive, we were delighted to see bees returning back uh, to that carved flower and entering the hole at the center of it. And this is a, an amazing discovery. Um, one day, while carefully deconstructing uh, the pinnacles, we observed that there was carved detail hidden within the structure. And so what you can see here, um, um, the, what the orange arrow points at, are a sequence of love hearts carved into the unprepared back of this pinnacle stone. So the mason, would never have expected this to see the light of day ever again. 
but I believe that it was his devotion um, that he was looking after, declaring his love for God and um, looking after his own soul by carving these love hearts um, in, uh, and having them remain forever after. And then we get back after that excitement to the essential, careful reconstruction of the pinnacles, ensuring that they are plumb and level uh, according to best masonry practice. And we removed the metal, uh, ferrous metal dog cramps and took the advantage of replacing those with, again, a BS British Standard 316 grade stainless steel dog cramp to do the job that the first dog cramps were meant to do. And good conservation practice means that we record, unlike our predecessors, um, we have made sure that we leave a full account of exactly what we did and where we did it. And here you have a graph showing um, the extent, the area of um, pollution products that we removed using laser. And here you can see um, one bay recording every part of the bay down the left-hand side and then recording every process along the top. Um, pollution products, environmental pollution, biological growth, um, OPC, environmental, uh, uh, anyway, I can decode those um, later. And we leave, we leave a schematic view of just what we did on each one of those um, areas uh, for as archive, left with the client to be retained as archive for future generations when they come to work on the building. So uh, you can see that the, the marked up computer dr uh, driven drawings um, are a very far cry from my early working drawings, handwritten, if you can recall those earlier in the presentation. And so we have um, some glamour photography of Rosalind Chapel now having completed the conservation uh, process. And I hope you'll agree with me in seeing that it is looking utterly resplendent. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Um, lots of questions. Um, if you're ready to take them up, I'll start with those. Of course. I'm so sorry for going over time. No, no, it's, it's absolutely fine. I think the question, the very first questions those have been asked are related to the conservation work that took place in the 1950s. So people, uh, we really want to know what was the chemical that was applied? How were you able to identify it? Were there any records to suggest that such a treatment had taken place then? And how has this treatment progressed over the years? I mean, has it affected in some way the building? Has it been like stable over the years since you could see the performance of that particular uh, chemical which was added? So how, your comments on that. Thank you. And that is an excellent question. Um, so we know that that building is called um, magnesium fluoride of silica. It is a proprietary um, stone hardening technology from the 1950s. Now, at least we know that that's a component of it because this was recorded as part of the 1950s record keeping as to what it was that they intended to do. However, um, I had the very great fortune to meet um, uh, a member of the congregation at Rosalind Chapel who happened to be a chemical salesman back in the 1950s. And I, I shared just one day that, you know, that I'd read that the internal surface treatment was magnesium fluoride silica. And he said, yes, it certainly was, he said, but it's a whole lot more. Because I, he said, I remember coming into Ministry of Works and selling them all great, all number of other materials in addition to this. So the movie clip that you saw, the painting of material, is actually um, a lime wash that's being applied to the surface. Now I should, uh, I should quickly tell you that in the 1950s when they opened the front door, what they found inside was a completely non-homogeneous -hom surface. They saw 
dead biological growth, they saw live biological growth, and they saw stones of many different colors. So they decided to apply a lime wash to the internal uh, masonry, but they also applied this stone hardening material. Um, but they also applied shellac and methylated spirits because their perception was that they had a problem of um, rising damp. They had a problem of damp in the building, but it was coming up through the ground and in through the walls. Now, what we have recently learned, of course, is that the air is dense with damp and we have condensation cycles. We don't necessarily have um, rising damp. My early moisture survey uh, was able to confirm that. So the Ministry of Works took a slightly wrong turn. So what they did was they tanked the inside. So that man painting on the scaffold is applying shellac, methylated spirits, shellac, methylated spirits, and lime wash, and building it up like a skin of an onion. But they're also using magnesium fluoride of silica in a great quantity. Um, and what that has resulted in is a lime wash that is harder than any cement-based material that you could ever fear. So the internal surface treatment of Rosalind Chapel is very, very hard. Um, I should say one of, the, one of the first treatments that the Ministry of Works did was to wash the inside of the stone, the inside of the chapel with a strong solution of ammonia uh, in order to kill biological material. And this promotes assault. So anyway, there's, there are a couple of things that we wouldn't do right there. Now, what effect has that had? It has had uh, a terrible effect in terms of, as part of the conservation and access project, the interior of Rosalind Chapel is being warmed by a biomass boiler some distance away, but it's created a, a, a very beneficial internal environment. But this internal environment is now warmer and more inviting to the migration of moisture from the walls that are actually now sodden as a result of being um, tanked by the Ministry of Works at that time. And what we see is a push. We see salt and other materials pushing hard against the surface treatment and springing it off. And there are some hot spots internally where there's the subsequent loss of carb detail as a result. It's quite a short question, but it is a very good question. So I, and just, to, just to quickly add, um, during our work at Rosalind Chapel, we conducted a trial. We conducted four different techniques to determine the answer to two questions. Those were, was it possible to remove this surface treatment as applied during the 1950s? And the other question was, was it desirable to remove the surface treatment from the 1950s? Was there anything left underneath? And so the trials we did in three areas within the chapel interior, and actually, if you were to visit Rosalind Chapel today, you would still see uh, one area of those trials still exposed. And you can see that we answered yes to both questions. Yes, it's possible to remove that surface treatment. And yes, it's desirable to remove that surface treatment because the numerous layers of shellac, methylated spirits, lime wash and um, consolidation products has, have blunted the internal carve detail. Whereas when you strip that back very carefully, you're liberating the detail and it's just so beautifully nuanced and created. What was used to remove these layers? We conducted four different uh, independent techniques. Um, we used laser. We used a very careful air abrasive. We used um, a chemical solution uh, in combination with an air abrasive. Um, and then we used um, a, an abrasive system on its own. So um, one of those, uh, one of those techniques, well, a combination of two of those techniques, actually, I, in, my, in my view, provide the correct level of um, efficacy without detriment to the underlying carved detail. Okay, thank you. The next question is, uh, while conserving any unfinished monument, such as Rosalind Chapel, 
or recreating any monument that was destroyed what are the challenges that are faced while taking decisions conservation decisions um do you gather similar material replicate the same artistic flow of that particular art form so question of decision making for an unfinished building or any monument that is destroyed this is utterly pertinent question and thank you for the question provider so we um were challenged by this very very same decision um so you can remember the unfinished nature of the building is its west end and we have the we have the buttress stumps as we've called them and we um found Rosalind Chapel in a state where the Trinidad Ashok company had applied bitumen to those wall stumps to try and stop the water getting into the masonry structure now they that had failed and we were being shrugged off by the building in fact and so um along with the architect we um undertook a sort of um a dialogue with ourselves to, to work out what the best detail would be so we wanted to re-encapsulate lead extend the lead roof onto the um transept stumps but in order to fix the lead we needed to put stone on top of the uh, stone wall heads and if we were putting one stone on top of the stone wall heads why didn't we just simply fulfill sir william sinclair's wish to build the tower so that it could be seen in edinburgh so where do we stop it, and that is the decision and that is this pertinent the pertinent nature of this question and so we decided to yes of course we conducted petrographic petrographic analysis of the existing building stone quarried very locally and we sourced a building stone that matched it that was that will that would we need to confirm we would not weather in a detrimental manner to the existing fabric so similarly geographic uh, geologically made up correct and we um bedded this stone in a traditional best practice correct and we raggled these new stones in order to accept the lead wall covering so um very good question and thank you for asking it thank you nick uh the other question is the problem of uh, sedimentary stones which are bedded and used like horizontal bedded sedimentary rocks used in a vertical position as you rightly said leads to delamination so what can be done to control this especially in case of relief sculpture on a pillar or decorated uh, pillar or carved pillar so how do you go about controlling these this maintenance so maintenance is this is another very good question i think that in the event the stone is shown to be face bedded in this case a short cut was made the mason was given the wrong piece of stone but he made the best of it and so uh, in order to sort of maintain the um design intent of that piece of stone then it just requires detailed and repeated maintenance so the sort of capital project that we undertook in order to um introduce very discrete resin pins very discrete metal pins um apply acrylic resin mortar and as you saw lime mortar with slate pinnings there needs to be um sort of an every two year review of this work and it's only by getting tactile access back to these um particular areas that require a high level high frequency of maintenance and i think it's maintenance is the answer thank you the next question is what is the most convenient method to remove lichen from large sandstone structures of course you did mention the mechanical means of doing it but is there a chemical solution which doesn't harm the stones any chemical method that can be used apart chemical from removing what please lichens lichens from uh, the lichen depositions from large sandstone structures yes very very good question now uh, i am of the firm belief that less is more in the sense that the fewer different material materials you apply to a given uh, historic structure um the the more you allow the 
routine functionality of the stone to um, occur. So I'm not a fan of biocide, for example, a chemical designed to kill and subdue the repeated growth of lichens. But I am a fan of very careful um, tool skills to remove the fruiting body of that lichen. And while other lichen may then come and grow in a juvenile sense, there will not be these large lichen fruit and bo fruiting bodies that are creating this particular decay phenomena. So um, my suggestion is similar to the last question, and that is that high frequency maintenance means that uh, conservator is engaged in very carefully controlling lichen growth as it's occurring, Rosalind Chapel, particularly on the north elevation. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question pertains to, I think, uh, it's meant for the scaffolding using iron bars. So while we are using the scaffolding uh, with iron bars, sometimes because of the corroding, the corrosion of these iron bars, the rust, the red color is passed down to the stones. I suppose it's been for a long time. So is this reversible or is, is, this, is this or is this irreversible? If Very I good. Yes, we, so we need to, we need to walk, along, walk amongst this uh, masonry structure with a very soft footprint. You're absolutely right. And in fact, Rosalind Chapel serves as a vehicle to warn us against. So I showed you a picture of the temporary enclosure being carefully deconstructed. And it was a demolition contractor who was engaged in the deconstruction of the temporary enclosure. And what we found on close examination of the building were where a grinder had been used in close proximity to the stone. And it had caused um, ferrous metal splits, splits to come and lodge into the surface of the stone. And this only became evident once those splinters began to corrode. So you're absolutely right. What we, in, what we, what we made sure of was that the scaffolding design for our own scaffolding, what came to know was, had no detrimental effect onto the building fabric whatsoever. Right? A scaffolder could inadvertently drop uh, a component of scaffolding and this could break something, right? So we asked the scaffolders to be very slow. We asked the scaffolders to be very careful. And what I didn't describe earlier, and what I should have said was that we wrapped and enclosed and isolated every part of the scaffold from the masonry structure. So timber plates interrupt between metal and stone. Plastic caps interrupt, isolate metal from stone. And in fact, we were using foam um, insulation because those um, working platforms had to function right the way through the winter. So we had to sort of create a warm environment, not just for the operatives who were working in there, but also you can imagine we were, um, we were pointing using the line process, which requires four degrees and rising temperatures. So we had to create an environment in there that meant that we could continue all the way through the winter, which meant that the scaffolding was particularly um, specialist. Okay, uh, Malvika Patania, do you want to add something to that question? Those of you whose questions were answered, do you want to add something? Please unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Uh, was the answer clear? I think we'll move on to the next question. The question is related to laser cleaning. Uh, the question is, have you done any pre-consolidation of those four petal flowers that you showed? Were they stable or were they powdering? Or was there any need to pre-consolidate them before using the laser for cleaning? Yes, so uh, a working risk assessment was created for this particular process. Um, and I, I described the laser as a virtual toffee hammer. So there is some um, percussive effect. So there was a, a pre-treatment and that was to ensure that if there are any areas of disaggregation or there are any areas of projecting detail that were vulnerable, that were loose, then these would be reattached and consolidated carefully. Um, and what we learned to do, in fact, was we, if we pre-treated 
the area to be ablated. Ablated means to have the pollution products removed by laser. So the area of ablation, for example, is that quadrifoil detail. We would brush the area with deionized water to start with and allow the water to dwell before applying the laser technology. And this utterly softened the effect. So this percussive, and when you hear a laser working, it's very much like this. It, it softens the percussive aspect, but increases efficacy. Who knew? Uh, the next question is on the desalination method that was used. Uh, the question is, some cases in the UK, it has been noted that salts are driven further into the masonry using this poultice method. So what was your observation and has there been a periodic inspection done in the Roslyn Chapel to see if such a thing had happened? Yes, that's a very good question. So yeah, even with the best will in the world, one could worsen the situation. So mobilizing salts you need to make sure that the salts when mobilized go in the, in the direction that we need it to go. So this was my um, point about we choose a warm day. So we create an environment. And in fact, if we need to create a booth and superheat the booth to ensure that we have a migration of salts to the surface and out of the surface as we need it. Um, but of course, soaking and repeatedly soaking any masonry structure, you might trigger another decay phenomena. You might be wetting um, a previously uncorroded ferrous metal cramp that's hidden within the structure. So we need to be very, very careful about and very aware of our intervention and the sort of unforeseen um, circumstances of that. But I'm happy to report that we, working, we were working at Rosalind Chapel for, for four years, 2009-2013. And the work that we conducted in 2009, we could look with, hue, with you know, very detailed intimate review to ensure that you know what were the results of that work how efficacy how effective were they um, and of course it's been 10 years since we actually finished that project um, anyway the, a lot of that work is 10 years old and so yes repeatedly i have been up and reviewed uh, some of the work that we've done and have seen no unforeseen circumstances but i have to say this is we work in the, with the best of intention. Sometimes mistakes are made, unforeseen circumstances occur, but we must record in detail and faithfully what we have done in our final report so as to inform any, anybody in the future. Okay, thank you. The next question is about the use of Paraloid B72 for the consolidation of stone and small repairs. Uh, why not use an inorganic silica-based material? There are options. What was the need to use an organic material in an organic in stone, which is inorganic? The major benefit of paraloid B seventy two. Thank you for this question because I again forgot this particular point. One of the key attributes and characteristics of acrylic paraloid B seventy two resin is its reversibility. So this um, paraloid B seventy two is. Uh, a ubiquitous, bit, a, a ubiquitous material that's used in the cons conservation of oil paintings, it's used in the conservation of organic substances and inorganic substances. But the one true virtue is that it is reversible. So by introducing a solvent once again by syringe, um, we can extract that material from whatever situation we have placed it. And in terms of undoing the repair mortar, the B72 based repair mortar. Um, it's with some pleasure actually that you can actually inject that and simply scoop it from the surface without any detriment to the original defect whatsoever. So this is utterly the main um, attribute of that material. Uh, there was an add on to that from Francesca. She said a dispersed silica could have been a good alternative, but I understand reversibility again was the reason why you didn't go for dispersed silica as an option. Yes, correct. Yeah. So the next question is on 
could you elaborate on the post conservation monitoring methods that are used by you the post conservation monitoring methods used by you to review the conservation treatment done it is solely empirical right so this is me visiting um, and using my eyes and ears and my understanding of some of the discrete repairs that we did and just assuring myself that you know we're giving value to the client and we're creating the doing the right thing by the building which i have a great fondness for um, having said that there are now um, data loggers recording temperature and relative humidity inside the chapel interior in order to uh, in order to control any future condensation episodes um, uh, and what we are actually seeing in detail is a cold bridge effect which is creating a condensation a very um, uh, very specific area of the roof is still suffering condensation because it, it, at the bell tower it doesn't feature this insulation that was introduced underneath the lead so there is um, further follow-up further analysis further understanding of the building in order to try and um, mitigate against further decay as a result of that blooming of biological material up there. Um, that's just one example. There is another example where ongoing works are required. Um, Rosalind Chapel is an amazing building, not least because it's beautiful and unfinished, but so many of the sort of masonry components that were about to go on the building were simply lying around in the precinct. And these are now in a, lip, a lapidarium down in the crypt. Um, and so there is ongoing work now in order to ensure that these stones are conserved in their own right, they're an extension to the building, and they're presented in such a way as visitors um, understand what they are and what they mean. And, and, you know, yeah. Okay, thank you. The question is related to recreating the ornamental motifs with acrylic resin over the pulverized sandstone. What is, what about the binding between these two different materials? And how do you ensure that the underlayer sandstone is not pulverized further when you add these ornamental motifs? The, that's a very good question. So we are, some people call conservators material fetishists. That means that we need a very detailed understanding of both materials, but also the interplay of materials, compatibility and incompatibility. And I agree with the questioner that there are circumstances under which paralloid B72 and um, a sandstone surface, there will be a tension, for example, in a high moisture movement, because paralloid B72 does have no water vapor carrying characteristics, right? So we're just doing the same thing as Ministry of Works, we're tanking that small area. So we just need to make sure that we don't do that. Um, also, there are limitations with lime working on a, in a sandstone environment. And sometimes what we have is what, what's called a sulfate, sulfate ring, a brown ring, which might occur around the outside of a, of a lime mortar repair as, a, as applied to some sandstones. So lime is, lime is good, lime is great, but not in every situation. So we just need to be aware of that as well. Okay, thank you. The next question is again, uh, understanding the recreation of motifs with acrylic resin, how do we actually go about it? And is this the only best practice? The, um, I think I'm happy to be challenged on whether the use of Paralog B72 is most sympathetic, most enduring and most reversible. Um, there may well be other materials, but my own empirical observations are that not just at Walsingham Chapel, but throughout my, throughout my career, I've seen acrylic resin based repairs um, applied during my time uh, in historic Scotland, still functioning, still doing, serving their purpose. And their purpose is always keeping the rain out of a crack or a fissure. Uh, and also using acrylic resin because that crack is too small for any other material that I know of to work in that way. And now with 20, 20 years experience, 
25 years experience, I've gone back to some of those very early um, repairs done by others, done by my predecessors using Paroid B72, and also using um, shellac in methylated spirits, which I believe is the precursor, which is the father of um, Paroid B72. Um, and, I, and I keep a careful eye, actually, on efficacy. But so far, so good, uh, I have to say. Okay. Uh, next question again, a challenge that uh, when we do remove pyroloid B72 uh, repairs, it usually takes out the stone, pulls out, uh, forms a film on the stone, uh, blocking the you know, pores of the stone. So again, if, if actually this is the correct repair, another question asked by her. Yeah, that's a lovely technical um, challenge. I think that we haven't been asked to reverse many um, parallel visa repair, repairs, but um, I did look at a, a project in Edinburgh City Centre, Edinburgh City Centre recently, which have um, acrylic resin um, edge pointing to scaling, that the edge pointing has decayed further and it's just left this film, uh, this ribbon of B72 based mortar on the stone. And this will be an excellent example of using acetone to mobilize and remove that material. But if we need to sort of reach in and, and recover, dissipate any further material, then we can use acetone or we can then further use trichloroethane. You know, these are these materials that are more, um, more missive, like they're more volatile and they are able to reach further into the stone and draw material out. We can poultice that material out. So I, I, by no means do I, do I hope, you know, I hope it don't appear conceited, but I think that we can, in every situation, lessen the material, remove our intervention um, without detriment to the stone and without long-term detriment to the stone. Thank you, Dick. Thank you for your patience. I think those are the questions related to the lectures. Uh, we will be having another talk by Nick Boyce in the future. So any other questions that come to mind, please save them for that talk. Today we are running out of time. Thank you so much for staying with us for so long. Thank you all of you for being with us. Um, I remains to thank Sushant Rana. Um, he was there to arrange this talk and my team which helped with the registration and the uploading of this video. We will be recording and uploading this video so you can watch in case some of you have missed it. I want to watch it again. Um, thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.